live with that one. So I think we'll just go with that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, for the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same Spirit, that we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. So last lesson we talked about <clears throat> the grace that was in the human soul of our Lord. And hopefully we understood to some degree that when we speak about the grace of union, what's called the hypostatic union, Hypostasis just means person. It's a Greek word for person. So the personal union, the hypostatic union is the personal union whereby our Lord has a human nature but is a divine person. There is no human person. There's just a divine person. But the fact that our Lord is a divine person does not of itself say something about his human nature. It's still a normal human nature. It's not a normal human person, it's, but it's a normal human nature. And we, um, we gave various reasons why we would think that, that our Lord in his human nature, besides having this grace of union, would also have an abundance of sanctifying grace. So we talked about last time. In this, this uh, catechism lesson, we want to talk about the knowledge of our Lord in his human nature. What kind of knowledge did he have and why we might we might ask ourselves why is this question important and we we have to understand that there are varying opinions on this many many different opinions i'm going to give you the the catholic opinion i'm going to give you the traditional catholic opinion as opposed to more modern catholics as opposed to Protestants, um, what Protestants have traditionally held on the knowledge possessed by our Lord in his human soul. Why is this important? Why, why would you think that it might be important for us to have uh, a certain belief on the knowledge possessed by our Lord in his human nature? Yes, Julie. So that we can relate to him. Um, yes. So if 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 um, to give an example, our Lord had no human knowledge, then he's not really living as a human being. If 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 everything in him is divine. And the, and the human nature is kind of empty. It's there, but it's not being used. Then maybe we couldn't relate to him. Um, I think one thing that's important for, for us, why it's important for us to reflect upon the knowledge possessed by our Lord, <clears throat> is because it says to us how God does the incarnation. Um, when, when God gives us his son, and endows him with the human nature and confers certain blessings upon him, how does he do it in his providence? And it really does affect our perception of God when we look at our Lord. Whatever, we, whatever way we perceive our Lord will necessarily reflect upon God himself. And if we think God made our Lord in, a, in, in one way, in, in way number A, then we're going to think of God according to that idea. As opposed we think our Lord, um, God made our Lord in this other way. Either way, 
Like, like if, you, if you just thought that our Lord, like the, the Mohammedans do, they just thought that our Lord was a prophet, a great prophet, but not God. Um, if, you, if you thought of our Lord as having a human nature, but having an empty, empty human nature, you, you would, um, yes, have a different idea of how God goes about redeeming mankind. So, I mean, all, all of these things, they do affect the way that we perceive God himself, um, the way that we, we, we pray to God, the way we um, think about God as, as being the one who created us, as being the one who um, has called us to heaven, is wanting to lead us to heaven, the way in which he chose to lead us to heaven. So <clears throat> it is an important question. And we're going to, to cover what St. Thomas says about it in the Tertia Pars, questions 9 to 12, is when he talks about the knowledge of our Lord. And <clears throat> there's four different knowledges that, that we have to understand the nature of four different knowledges <clears throat> that St. Thomas covers so that we can then apply them to our Lord. First of all, there is divine knowledge. Then there's beatific knowledge, infused knowledge, and acquired knowledge. So these are, these are as I say, types of knowledges Now, the divine knowledge, what is the divine knowledge? The divine knowledge is simply the same as God himself. The divine knowledge is God. In other words, God is not distinct from his knowledge. Whereas what I am as a human being, me, Paul Robinson, as a person, is distinct from what I know. My action of knowing is different from my action of being. What I am is different from what I do. One of the things I do is know, speak, what have you, and they are two different things. And, well, that's, that's one part of living in time, where there's, there's succession. When you live in time, you're, you, do one thing after another thing. Your actions succeed one another. But this is not the way it is with God. God is utterly and absolutely simple. He undergoes no change. And to be a being who is eminently active, but is not changing, what that means is that you do one action always. So God knows but his knowledge is not a different action from what he is. He is God forever, and he is knowing forever by one and the same act. And so there's no distinction in God between what he is and his action of knowing. They are one in the same. Um, so... That's the divine knowledge. Uh, is, does anybody know how God knows? Like, God knows everything. God is omniscient, right? And his being is the same as his knowing. But how does God know? How does, how does God know everything? Source. Google? Um. <laughs> He's the source of all knowledge. So if you designed and made a car, would you know that car? Yes, right? You would know that car. You would know it much better than someone who wrote in the car or read the user manual for the car because you were the one who actually invented it, created it. You know its intimate parts and how they work together because you designed it precisely 
so that it could do what it's meant to do. So God knows everything here below by the fact that he makes everything. And at every moment, he sustains everything in existence. He has to know it by the fact that he is making all that is in the universe exist at this moment. None of the things in the universe can exist on their own. He's making them exist at each moment. By the fact that he is making them exist, he knows them. He knows them. But ultimately, he knows all things in knowing himself. We well, could really say in being himself. But um, so God is omniscient. Um, he's omniscient. He knows all things. The beatific vision is a human knowledge or is, is a knowledge. It's, it's not necessarily human knowledge. So you've got Bob here. And the beatific vision is where God himself, God himself, is in the mind. Not an idea of God. Not an idea of God. It's not the formation of a concept of God. It is God himself who is in the mind. You know the distinction. Here below, we can form an idea of God. That's all we can do. We can't have God sort of be, to be the form of our intellect. So when we form an idea of God, we, we believe. We make this act of faith, form a concept. God is an immaterial being. He is eternal. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. We take all of these concepts and we, we build a concept of God. But that's not God. Our, our idea of God is not God. It's an image, a representation, a mental representation of God, but it's not God, right? With the beatific vision, and this is what Catholics believe, is the essence of heaven. When you go to heaven, God, be, he, be, he, he enters your intellect. This is why it's called a vision, you know, when, when, you're, when you're studying like a math problem or something, and then you're working on it, and then finally you say, oh, I see. I know what, I know what this is. You say, I see. There's like, a, there, there's like an internal vision that we have, and that is the vision of our mind whereby we comprehend something. And, and we use the language of, I see something for comprehension. So there's, there's a seeing on the side of our senses, where we see with our eyes, material things, but there's also a seeing on the side of our mind. And when we speak of the beatific vision, it's not a vision with our eyes, um, to where we see, oh, there's God, you know, he's an old man with a big beard or something like that, you know, how he's traditionally represented. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God himself in our mind. Not an idea of God, God himself. Scripture speaks about seeing God face to face. This is the essence of beatitude. Why is it the essence of beatitude, of heaven? Because God contains in himself all perfection. There can be no greater delight, no greater fulfillment of any creature than seeing the source of all happiness, joy, pleasure, perfection, whatever. There, there, there can be no possible um, greater satisfaction to any creature whatsoever than seeing the source of all the things that we have here below, all the things we may delight in, all the things that, that may, may fill our hearts, um, are contained in their source, in the most concentrated form, in God himself. So when God becomes the form of one's intellect in heaven, the soul is beatified. To be beatified means to be made happy, 
to be made happy. The soul is made happy, supremely happy. And so um, you're in heaven. You're in heaven. So that's beatific knowledge. Infused knowledge is when God himself doesn't put himself in your mind, but he puts ideas in your mind. So we're going to put like I1, I2, I3, I4, I whatever. The infusion of ideas is when God creates concepts and puts them in your mind. This is the proper, this is the knowledge proper to angels. It's the knowledge proper to angels. When God creates an angel, he's creating a pure intelligence. He's creating a being that is just spirit, is just mind and will and which um, has no body, has no body. So how do they know? Well, God puts ideas into their minds. He puts concepts into their minds. And we say the higher angels have better ideas. God gives them higher ideas. Then he gives the lower angels. You know, there's the nine, the nine choirs of angels. And the higher the angel, the more brilliant their intelligence the smarter God has made them. Um, and we say that Lucifer was one of the highest angels, right? God made him have the best ideas. So this is, this is what infused knowledge is. We say that, that for instance, um, Adam was given this knowledge. He was created as an adult, and he was given knowledge right there. He did, there was nowhere to go to school at that time. Nobody was around, you know, so how would he know anything? He didn't have a mom and a dad to teach him. And so God gave him knowledge, and from that knowledge, he was to instruct others. So these ideas come straight from God. The acquired knowledge <clears throat> is the knowledge proper to human beings. Um, I forgot to mention, you know, like someone like St. Paul. St. Paul had infused knowledge. Like when he was struck from his horse, he, God gave him knowledge of the, of, the, of the Catholic faith, just like that. Or St. Catherine of Siena, you read her life. She received knowledge from God, directly from God. Uh, for instance, she did not, she was never taught how to read. She just automatically knew how to read. Um, and she knew like the mysteries of the faith. She was explaining the mysteries of the faith in a very sublime way. She was not instructed. But for the rest of us, I'm sorry, I don't have infused knowledge. I don't think you have infused knowledge. If you do, we need to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, for a long time. <laughs> I'll take notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the rest of us peons in the intellectual world, we are stuck with the lowest mode of knowing the mode proper to human beings. Yes, so, so what we do, um, these drawings just keep getting worse. Oh, uh, yeah. As you can say, artistry is, is, is not in any way, shape, or form something that I have infused knowledge to do. Um, okay, I can't make awesome trees though. Um, so, so what we do as human beings, the, the ability that God has given to us in our very nature is that 
When we experience a sensation from the outside world, for instance, by vision or hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching, we form an interior image of that in our brain and our imagination. Any sensation, it doesn't have to be something we see, it can be something we hear. You know, you, you, you try to replay a song in your mind, you can do that. You can do that in your imagination, in your brain. And you have a faculty called the agent intellect. And the agent intellect is able to take that sense image and draw from it its essence. Draw from it its essence. And this, is, this, this action of your intellect is called, what, what, what do we call this? Not perception, that's the sense. That's the sense part where you hear or you taste or you smell. But the action of the agent intellect to draw out from it the essence is called abstraction. 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 So your agent intellect abstracts. For instance, you see the dog. And you have all the visual impact that that has on you. But it's a wash of colors and motion and so on. Fine. The animals are able to know the dog at that level. But because you have this immaterial faculty of the agent intellect, you're able to draw out of it the nature of the dog. What is the nature of a dog? That is the things that pertain to all dogs. The essence, the very essence of what it means to be a dog. A four-legged canine, you know, tail wagging, uh, tongue flopping creature, I man's best friend, whatever you want. <laughs> whatever is common to, to all dogs, um, you form this idea. So... These are four types of knowledge. And we want to ask ourselves, which of these our Lord has in his human soul? Which of these does our Lord have in his human soul? Does he have divine knowledge in his human soul? No, why, why not? Because um, the essence of being a human is different than the essence of being a human. Yes, yes, yes. This divine knowledge only belongs to the divine nature. No, the human soul does not have the capacity to possess divine knowledge because the human nature would have to be uncreated. It would have to have the very properties of God, eternal, where its action and its being were one and the same. And that cannot be true of any human being by definition, by the fact that it's created, that it exists in time that it's knowing is separate from its being. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> our Lord does not have divine knowledge in his human nature. He has divine knowledge in his divine nature, but not his human nature. Then we consider the beatific knowledge, the infused knowledge, and the acquired knowledge. And traditionally, if you, if you read these, these questions of St. Thomas and the Summa, sort of the gold standard for Catholic orthodoxy, you will find that St. Thomas gives arguments that our Lord possesses all three of these types of knowledge that can be possessed by human beings. Human beings can possess these three types of knowledge. Um, we hope one day to possess the beatific knowledge, but we say that our Lord possessed this beatific knowledge even here on this earth. We are not destined to possess infused knowledge. 
it was for Adam and Eve, it was for St. Paul, St. Saint, Saint Catherine of Siena, uh, but that's, that's only by exception. Normally, this is not the human way to know. Acquired knowledge, we all have acquired knowledge. Um, so, <clears throat> I want to go through some of the reasons that St. Thomas gives for, for um, our Lord to possess these types of knowledge. But, firstly, to, to say that there's different views. Catholics... Um, let's just say traditional, um, and then then you have more uh, less traditional. I I don't know. And then Protestants. Typically, when when you see others treat these questions, they don't treat them in terms of these categories. They treat them in terms of this. Was our Lord in his human nature ignorant of anything? Did he lack any knowledge? Or did he have all knowledge? And you may be saying to yourself, well, isn't it impossible for him to know all things in his human nature? No, no, it's not impossible. It's not impossible because the, the knowledge of all things is in fact finite. It's finite. This is different from God's omniscient, omniscient knowledge um, to know all things. So it is possible in, that in his human nature, he knew all things because that is a limited number of things. It's a lot. It's an awful lot, right? But it's still a limited number of things. Um, so let's, let's just create these categories. We'll, we'll say Catholics and then the rationalists and the modernists. Protestants have held that Christ was ignorant of many things, and it was only gradually that he acquired knowledge of his mission. So again, we recall that the fact that he's a divine person does not mean anything on the level of his action. It makes him divine in his very being, but it doesn't necessarily make his human nature have certain possessions or abilities because his human nature is not touched in itself by the fact of being a divine person, having the divine existence to make it exist. So that's why there's this discussion. And some, some say <clears throat> that he only... Um, understood who he was over a period of time. Calvin, in his commentary on Matthew, says that the Son of God, out of love for us, did not refuse the humiliation of ignorance, and that during the Passion, the intensity of his suffering was so great that he forgot about the decree of God sending him to redeem the human race. His suffering was so intense that it just like blew away his mind, and he forgot even that he was the Messiah on, on the cross. And this would be Calvin's way to explain that word of our Lord on the cross, right? You know, when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Calvin's view, oh, he wouldn't say that if he understood he was the Messiah. So the only way he can be saying that he's the Messiah is he, he, he just like forgot at that point because the crucifixion was so painful. It's the fact that he remained silent, whereas most of crucifix, crucifix victims would um, speak out. Speak out and insult because the, the level of pain was so intense uh, that they were insulting the entire world. Yes. Uh, well, it was. And, and so the, the, the 
sometimes the Romans would uh, cut out their tongues, silence them. Oh, I didn't know that. And, I didn't know that. And, and that didn't happen with our law. Yes. That was extremely unusual for him to be silenced. Yes. And you, uh, apparently, the crucifix fiction victims, when they um, are found in the tombs, they like their features are distorted and they, they look <clears throat> completely miserable from what they've been through. But the picture of our Lord, the, 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 the image of our Lord that's on the Shroud of Turin is of a man who has extreme peace. You know, his, his, his features are not distorted. Um, so... Same with Zwingli and Beza, Theodore Beza. They all, they all said that, that he had ignorance. Um, so he did not know everything. Um, grew in total knowledge over time. And this is represented in a blasphemous movie that you may have heard about that caused protests back in the day. There's a lot of protests. Anybody know what movie I'm talking about? Martin Scorsese? Last Temptation of the Christ? Yes. Yes. Last Temptation of Christ in 1988. And when they were having uh, protests in France, they were blaming it on Archbishop Lefebvre and the traditionalists, you know. Um, but there were protests around the world with this movie. They were mainly because of the blasphemies about our Lord and his moral life and with St. Mary Magdalene and, and all that. Um, but this movie, which, by the way, I have not seen and I intend never to watch, um, this movie represents our Lord as not knowing that he's the Messiah and slowly but surely over time, recognizing that he's the messiah and it gives this vision of basically man creates god god is something that you make on your own you just eventually believe yourself to be god um it's not like there is a god who makes things happen here below but uh you develop the consciousness, your own divine consciousness over time. That's how they explain the life of our Lord, that he took on the identity, he self-identified as God or the Messiah over time. But of course, he wasn't really. Yeah. Um, the rationalists and the modernists, they, they also say that Christ did not know all things and was not always conscious of his messianic uh, dignity. Um, they, um, they try to make the claim that <clears throat> our Lord thought that the end of the world was coming in his own lifetime, based on certain things that are recorded in the Gospels. Um, that They speak of this eschatological Christ who um, thought the end was nigh, um, like like all the Protestant preachers on the side of the street, you know, um, repent, the end is nigh, it's, it's all coming soon. Um, this includes the, the archetypal modernist, the, the, uh, the Catholic priest who is excommunicated. This is, I think, during the pontificate of Leo XIII, Alfred Loisy. Alfred Loisy. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he, he propagated this idea. So he says that our Lord preached an eschatological or end times kingdom following the mentality of his contemporaries and did not know what would become of his teaching. What followed the church and a spiritual kingdom was in fact different from what he expected. So he was in error on that score. Our Lord in his preaching, he was thinking, oh, for my preaching, well, the end times are going to come. Um, but he was not expecting the Catholic church to result from his uh, preaching. <laughs> that's, that's a rationalist and modernist. So they, they kind of agree with the Protestants there. And the, the, the modernism grew, grew out of Protestant scriptural 
critique the 19th century rationalists, Protestants, and their critiques of scripture um, basically gave birth to modernist belief. And then it was adopted by, by Catholics as well. Um, now, when we come to the teaching of the church, it's de fide that Christ never erred, um, that Christ was infallible. It's, so this is something we have to believe, that he never made a mistake in his knowledge. He, you know how when we, when we think something is true and it's not actually true, we commit an error. This is a judgment on our mind, a false judgment on our mind. I think X is true, but it's actually not true. And I get corrected later on. It's like, oh, I was wrong about that. Um, stay feeding that our Lord was never wrong in that way. Now, as far as ignorance goes, that we give that the qualification of theologically certain. Theologically certain. So there's, there's different degrees of certitude of teachings in the Catholic faith. Some of them um, the church defines and makes clear for her children, this is part of what we believe. Other things do not have that level of certitude. And whether or not our Lord knew everything in his human nature is not de fide. It's theologically certain, which is pretty high, but not de fide. Um, so St. Thomas certainly believed that our Lord had no ignorance. And there are the various passages from Scripture are there any, can you think of any passages in Scripture that might make you think that our Lord did know everything in his human nature? The teaching at the temple. The teaching at the temple? At the, at the, at the age of 12. Yes. That, that implied that he was smart. That implied that he was smart. The woman at the well, he knew that she had five husbands. Right? And you're like, well, how did he know that? Right? Yeah. She was living with somebody else. Yeah, so he knew things about her life that he could not, like when nobody knows where that information could have come from. How did he know that the girl was only asleep that he brought back life? Well, Sometimes our Lord spoke of, he like even spoke of Lazarus as sleeping. <laughs> so that could be just an expression for death. Um, the mother said, Your son needs to go back home. Yes. He works miracles from a distance. He works miracles from a distance. He knows what the scribes are thinking. He knew the secret of hearts. He knew the secret of hearts. He knew what people were thinking. We know that this is not even possible for the angels to know what people were thinking. Um, he knew it was on people's minds. So that's, that's pretty extraordinary. In Matthew chapter 16, it says, They thought within themselves, saying, Because we have taken no bread. That's why he's saying this. Jesus, knowing it, says, why do you think within yourselves, O ye of little faith, for that you have no bread? He's like reading their minds. Um, another thing is, is that he, <clears throat> he foretold many things before they happened. Uh, the betrayal of Peter, his own passion, which he's, he's giving details of several times in the Gospels. The destruction of Jerusalem uh, by the Romans, he foretells. And he even says, I am the truth. I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Which, which implies um, a higher level of knowledge than, than just the particular knowledge. Um, in the last gospel that is read, <clears throat> At the end of every Mass, 
we have the first chapter of St. John, and it speaks of our Lord as being full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. So th that's uh, various reasons we can give to say that um, our Lord had all knowledge, even in his human nature. Besides that, there is the decree of Lamentabili by St. Pius X. Lamentabili is uh, a, a series of errors condemned by St. Pius X. These errors accompanied his encyclical against the modernists because the modernists were attacking scripture. If you read the encyclical Pascendi, you will find in there their notion of our Lord, uh, who is just a man who had an elevated religious sense. He wasn't really God. Um, so they um, attack the divinity of our Lord, and St. Pius X issues this list of errors, which he says to Catholics, these, these are false. You must not believe in these things. If you believe in these things, um, you... You commit a sin, you're going to hell. So, error number 32. The natural sense of the gospel text cannot be reconciled with what our theologians teach about the consciousness and the infallible knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, um, the gospel is not teaching that our Lord is infallible. Condemned. 33. It is evident to everyone who is not influenced by preconceived opinions that either Jesus professed an error concerning the immediate coming of the Messiah, or the greater part of the doctrine contained in the synoptic gospels is void of authenticity. So it's, it's evident that he was wrong about the coming of the Messiah. That is false. Then 35, Christ did not always have the consciousness of his messianic dignity. Always. Error. False. False. Um, so, number 34 is a bit more complicated. And it concerns, it's, it's the only one that concerns our Lord having all knowledge in his human nature. It says, the critic cannot ascribe to Christ knowledge circumscribed by no limit, except on the supposition, which can by no means be conceived historically, and which is repugnant to the moral sense, namely, that Christ as man had the knowledge of God, and nevertheless was unwilling to share the knowledge of so many things with his disciples and posterity. So they're saying, you cannot say that Christ had all knowledge unless you say that he had the knowledge of God. And that's condemned. Pisces is saying, well, you can say that he had all knowledge on the side of his human nature. You can say that. Um, okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about these various knowledges, the beatific knowledge, the infused knowledge, and the acquired knowledge. Um, did our Lord have beatific knowledge. In other words, when, when God is, is, is saying, I'm going to send to the human race the Messiah, he's going to possess my very existence. Whereas with us, we have an existence, God gives us existence, but it is an existence separate from the existence of God. Whereas our Lord, his human nature subsists with the very existence of God. The existence of his human nature is not separate from the existence of God, whereas the existence of me is separate from the existence of God. So, when our Lord, when, when God decides to <clears throat> make this human nature, does he bestow beatific knowledge upon it? Does he give in our Lord's intellect, does he have himself be present in the intellect of our Lord? So, um, St. Thomas says yes and and when when saint thomas goes through all of these knowledges his main argument is that our lord had to have a perfect human nature 
that if you're going to make this human nature be a divine person, then it's only fitting that it be the most perfect human nature. It's an argument of fittingness. And that's the best that theology can do. Theology is not able to prove anything definitively, mathematically. It can only make cogent arguments of fittingness, saying it's very appropriate that it be this way. Because of the fact that, that this is something that's beyond reason anyway. There is something that's accept, accessible to reason, but there's also something that's beyond reason. Uh, a human nature possessing the beatific vision or possessing all knowledge is, is not something like if, if we had our Lord standing here before us, we could never prove definitively that he had all knowledge. I mean, like, how would you do that? You yourself would have to possess all knowledge. You would have to have an all knowledge possessing instrument test, right? I mean, like, what kind of, what kind of test do you administer? Um, like, okay, he aced the IQ test. Does that mean he knows everything? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So it's beyond our power to assess that in anybody. In theology, um, what we're doing is given reasons of fittingness. And um, these, this exercise <clears throat> of reflecting upon these things and giving the reasons of fittingness, as I say, help us understand God better, our Lord better, and hopefully profit spiritually from it. Um, <clears throat> so, St. Thomas um, says that our Lord had other knowledge than um, I'm, I'm losing the, the article here. Okay. He says that, that our Lord had beatific knowledge. He's, he argues from Scripture. I want to give you an argument from Scripture. I want to give you the teaching of the Magisterium, um, Pius XII's encyclical, Mystic, Mystic Corporis, and then I'm going to give you the argument of reason. And this is how we, we approach things theologically. It's like, what does Scripture say? What does the Magisterium say? And finally, is this reasonable? Um, in John, it's, it's all throughout the Gospel of John. Um, no one ever saw God. This is our Lord speaking, or no, this is uh, St. John speaking. No one ever saw, saw God. Um, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he himself declares him. So this, this implies that our Lord um, sees God. Our Lord sees God. Our Lord himself, speaking of himself, no one ascends into heaven, but he who descended from heaven the Son of Man who is in heaven. Our Lord speaks to Nicodemus and says that he is in heaven. Later on in that same chapter, and this is perhaps the evangelist speaking, he who came from heaven is above all, and what he sees and hears, this he testifies. He who came from heaven, what he sees. Um, coming from heaven. John chapter 6, not that anyone has seen the Father, but he who is from God, he sees the Father, speaking about himself. John chapter 8, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, because I know where I've come from and where I'm going, um, heaven John chapter 8, verse 38 is clear. What I see before my Father, this I speak. Um, I'm having a little trouble here because the, all these quotations are in Latin. I don't know why I'm <laughs> doing this to myself. But anyway, um, so uh, John chapter 17, those whom the Father has given to me, I will that where I am, they also may be with me, and they may see my glory, which you have given to me. Um, where I am, they also may be. It's like our Lord, is, again, is in heaven. 
Here's what, what uh, Pope Pius XII teaches in Mystici Corporis, which I think was in the 1940s. 1940s when this encyclical came out. Such a most loving knowledge as the divine redeemer from the first moment of his incarnation bestowed upon us surpasses any zealous power of the human mind since through that beatific vision which he began to enjoy when he had hardly been conceived in the womb of the mother of God, he has the members of his mystical body always and constantly present to him and he embraces all with his redeeming love. So this is um, a statement by, by Pius XII that our Lord possessed the beatific vision from the first moment of his conception in his human soul. Uh, so, so he had this knowledge here. <clears throat> then the proof from reason. And this proof from reason, I, I'm actually not taking from St. Thomas. There's, there's a Dominican out there, uh, Father White, Father Thomas White. He has a book called The Incarnate Lord. It's a tough read. But um, he gives a very, I think, a very cogent reason for <clears throat> our Lord possessing beatific knowledge. Uh, this book was printed in 2017, um, Catholic University of America Press. Here's his argument. <clears throat> In order for Christ to be fully human, his psychological choices must be rational and natural. But for them to be the choices of his divine person, they must be unified with his divine will on the level of his personal action. What he's saying is, is that if you are a divine person, possessing a human nature, then it's only fitting that the two match up. There would be kind of a disconnect if on the level of the human nature, there were, were not this beatific knowledge. If you had a divine person, it wouldn't, it almost like wouldn't make sense for, for that. For them to be the choices of a divine person. If you want to make choices of a divine person with your human nature, you are a divine person, you're making choices, then you need the beatific vision to, to do that. But for the choices of Christ's human nature to be united with the choices of the divine will, it was necessary that the human nature have immediate knowledge of the divine will. This immediate knowledge could only take place through the beatific vision. So only if he had the beatific vision would he be so close to God that he would have immediate knowledge of the divine will? Yes. What part did his human will play then? Well, the, the, the intellect and the will are different. So we're just talking about what he knows. It's up to the human will then to follow the divine will. We're just talking about him knowing the divine will, knowing what God wants. Um, doing, choosing what God wants is something separate. It is a moral choice. Um, so that's, that's the argument for <clears throat> the um, beatific knowledge. For the infused knowledge, what, what does St. Thomas say? He says, okay, if you've got beatific knowledge and, and you have the beatific vision, yet it is so transcendent that you cannot formulate words to speak about it. This is what St. Paul says. I have not seen nor hear has heard, you know, um, the, 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 the glory that's, that God has prepared. I um, mean, this is a Dante very um, almost humorously <laughs> when, when he finally read, you finally reach the end of the Divine Comedy after going through all those cantos, 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 you know, like you're on canto 99 or 98 out of 100. And he's talking about the vision and he's like, it was so sublime, I just cannot say anything about it. And then he goes on for like 100 verses saying how he can't say anything about it. <laughs> That's why it's kind of, kind of funny. He talks a lot about how he can't talk about it. Um, so when St. Thomas is saying, 
our Lord also had infused ideas, it's because our Lord had to be a teacher for others. He had to use his human nature to teach. And if he just had the beatific vision, he would not be able to formulate the proper concepts. He, had, he, needed, he needed discrete concepts in order to be able to speak. This is how we form words. The words that we speak are symbols of the, the, the ideas that we have in our minds. So we form words off of our ideas. And our language is, is simply sounds that represent the ideas that we have in our head. So our Lord would need these discrete concepts, all these different concepts, just so that he could speak about divine things and communicate them to fellow human beings. That's why St. Thomas said that he needed infused ideas. And then lastly, <clears throat> acquired knowledge. I think we can guess why, why St. Thomas would argue that our Lord also had acquired knowledge. Anybody think about why would our Lord also have this kind of knowledge where his mind was forming concepts from the things that he saw and sensed and so on. How would it make sense? Yes. Are you saying that he acquired this throughout his life? Or no, no, he acquires it throughout his life. Okay. Yeah. Because human nature necessitated it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if he's a human being yeah. and he has a human mind, then that human mind is going to act, right? It's, it's going to do things. So it would be really strange for him to have a human mind that doesn't do properly proper human things. Okay, so, so just because he's a human, he's a real human being, he's going to have this acquired knowledge. So his human mind is going to be forming concepts. He's not just going to have the infused concepts. He's not just going to have the beatific vision, but he's going as he goes on in his life, be making concepts in his, in his mind. And there's no incompatibility between these two. These are concepts that are put here by God, and these other concepts are, are concepts that are made by the mind that, that himself. Um, these concepts are superior. The concepts that we make are more basic, less clear, more fuzzy, than, than the infused concepts that would, that would come from God um, because we take them from, from matter, which um, kind of shrouds or covers the essences of things. It's, it obscures, matter obscures the essences of things. So the concepts we form are not as perfect as the infused knowledge. Yes? No, because, because of the fact that they, these are distinct types of knowledge. So you're not, you're not necessarily going to, this is not a concept. Um, it's not a bunch of concepts. It's just God. Just God. You would see things in God, but there's no idea if that makes any sense. <laughs> would that be the perfection of the human? It's beyond human nature. It's, it's, not, it's beyond our nature. It's not proper to our nature. It's supernatural. It's transcendence. This is, this is not, does not belong to our capacity. We even say that we have to have an upgrade when we get to heaven, even for this to, to happen. Anybody remember what that's called from last year? No. What, 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 what kind of upgrade do we need when we get to heaven? What, what kind of upgrade... It's called the light of glory. The light of glory is, is like, a, um, you know, it's like Windows 11. Like, you, you know, you get, <laughs> you get an upgrade <laughs> to your mind just so that you can receive the beatific vision. Because naturally speaking, you can't uh, because we're just humans. Um, so, um, all right. So that, that's, uh, I know this is, this is like oh, pretty theological and stuff. Hopefully, okay. And Father explained what kind of knowledge a soul might have in purgatory. 
Right. Um, so when we die, our soul is separated from our body. And <clears throat> we no longer have this connection to the outside reality whereby we're forming concepts. And um, there's a dispute that that state is kind of mysterious. We generally hold that, that God will give you the knowledge that you need that, that corresponds to you, that, that he will give you those ideas, he'll give you information about what, what pertains to you, um, and you would have the concepts that you've already formed, right? Your, your, what's called your intellectual memory, and that's your database of ideas that you formed during this life. Um, but, but you wouldn't, it's, it's kind of mysterious to us what exactly that state is like where you're a disembodied soul, a ghost, you know. Um, yeah. Yes, so, Xavier. Um, our Lord has free will. Yes. Yes, he had a real human will that made choices. That made choices. Yes, it was not determined. Yes, yeah. Um, so as they say, we, we, we go over this and we um, hopefully are able to reflect on the perfection of our Lord's human nature. And we go to him with confidence. We're confident that, that he has all truth and he's able to lead us to heaven. Right? He possesses all truth in his human nature. What he says is true. He's not afflicted with ignorance. He's not going to make errors. I don't. I need not hesitate to go to him um, for what I need to know in order to save my soul. Um, we we also esteem him as having being the most perfect human, um, having having the most perfect humanity. Um, oh. As, as opposed to thinking of him as someone who's confused about who he is. You know, this is a blasphemous representation of, of our Lord. Um, yes. Okay, so that concludes today's lesson. Um, we'll finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome.